You can do a little introduction here. Sure. Good morning, everybody. This is Mark Richardson with Vibrant Technology, uh, and welcome to our March webinar. Uh, this month we are uh, going to be looking at ODS videos and documenting machine condition utilizing a feature that's uh, built into Emmyscope for creating videos. And really the premise here is, is the ability to look at an archived ODS versus a current ODS and do comparisons that way and be able to identify different uh, changes in the machine condition. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over. Actually, before that, let me just talk a couple housekeeping items. If you have questions, there's a questions box on the right-hand side in the, uh, the little panel area. Feel free to type out your questions, and then at the uh, tail end of the webinar, we'll leave some time to get those questions answered. Uh, and if we don't get all the questions answered, by all means, you can email those to sales at vibetech.com, and uh, we'll be sure to get those questions answered for you. Uh, with that, let me hand it over to my dad, Mark Richardson Sr. He's going to be uh, taking us through the webinar this morning. And uh, dad, I believe you have the controls, so we got, we're seeing your screen now, and I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Mark, and welcome to those of you in attendance, wherever you are. Uh, I'm, uh, we're in Denver, Colorado, and it's, what, 10 o'clock in the morning. And on your screen, you should see a diagram of the software that we're going to demonstrate today. Uh, we call it Emmyscope MSS for Machine Surveillance Series. Now, our traditional MBScope software is MBScope VES, which it stands for uh, Visual Engineering Series. We've been selling that software for 25 some years. What we've done is expanded the capabilities. Well, we're using the basic capabilities of MBScope, but for uh, machine monitoring, condition monitoring, and today we're going to demonstrate its use uh, in uh, route-based or uh, walk-around collection uh, machine monitoring, which is probably 80%, maybe plus 80% uh, plus uh, use of uh, walk-around data collectors for monitoring the condition of machinery in a plant, uh, any type of uh, process machinery. So you can see here a diagram that shows Emmyscope in one of our uh, portable Pelican carrying cases. So in that carrying case is acquisition, uh, simultaneous acquisition, and uh, a computer uh, with Emmyscope running in it. In a walk-around collection scenario, we wouldn't use that. We would simply use the Emmyscope software running in a tablet or in a laptop and use the uh, battery powered collector uh, and there's many uh, different models offered by different companies. Uh, again, Emmyscope uh, is a software package, Vibrant is a software company, so what we are marketing is not any hardware, even though there's hardware in that Pelican box there. It, it's simply uh, packaged so that we can put Emmyscope in a, in a portable system. Uh, what we're going to show today is the software itself, post-processing data that's been collected with any kind of a, a multi-channel front end. Uh, could be two channels and more. Obviously, to, to look at ODS, we need both uh, magnitude and phase. Uh, of multiple points on the machine. So we're going to look at animated ODS data taken uh, that was acquired with at least two channels. Typically accelerometer data is what we collect, although we can collect proximity probe data. Uh, many of the machines in a plant have prox probes built in, uh, and if it's the GE Bentley variety, they have, uh, we could even use uh, Emmyscope uh, in a portable carrying case uh, with BNC connectors. Uh, these yellow boxes you see here have BNCs on them. 
and uh, so we could connect right up and, and use the uh, orbit data. Uh, typically, uh, prox probes will monitor the horizontal and vertical, and we can use that data also in MEScope and look at ODSs. We're not going to do that today. We're going to look at accelerometer data. Uh, the other pieces of the puzzle here are a large machine-based database. So we've added a new database to MEScope that's much larger uh, than the, uh, the project file database. But this new database, it's, a, it's an SQL. It's called SQL Lite. It's a, it's a flat file. It's a, you know, a file that you can copy from one computer to another. And its uh, storage capacity is unlimited. So it's only restricted by the storage capacity of, of the computer that you're using it on. And then the top part of the diagram here is what we call our MSS console. And that is a program that can be stored on or installed on virtually any device. You can see here we've got it in a, in a uh, touch pad or in a desktop or even in a, in a portable phone. Uh, all of our software is migrating in that direction so that it will be easy to use. Uh, the console part will be easy to use in any of those environments. Uh, let me put this down and let's just dive right in and uh, look at some of our uh, software here. So here, here is MEScope. So again, think of this as post-processing. I've already acquired some data with a data collector and uh, either in the field or uh, after I've returned from the field, the plant uh, with uh, multi-channel data. So it could be two channels. Typical data collectors are either two channels or four channels. And the way we would collect the data is use one channel as a reference. So that would be a we say reference, that's an accelerometer mounted on the machine that doesn't move as we acquire the data. The other accelerometer could be either a uniax or a triax or anything in between that we call the roving accelerometer. And that one, uh, we would acquire data uh, with the roving in one position. It could be with a magnet or a attached to the machine uh, in a typical route based uh, correct phase uh, between all of the roving responses. So we're looking at relative phase here and uh, and then relative magnitude. So that's what we need for an ODS. You can see I've got a number of projects here that have been open recently in MEScope. Uh, and what we're going to do, though, is go right to the, the console software. Let me open that up. Uh, do I have a copy down here? OK, I do. So here is console. And I'm going to just leave it running this is they're all running in the same computer and the database is in my computer uh, so with our new uh, unlimited database this is not network based we we have a different database a different version of sql that is network based so that, that database can be in the cloud it can be on a company network this database has to be located where emiscope and console are because it's a it's a flat file and but I can have machine data in there for that I've archived for uh, for years, basically. And then what we're going to show here is how we can compare the archived data with the uh, with the acquired data that we've just gotten from, let's say, the field. So here I've got four different machines. This is a machine gallery, and you can see one of them is blinking yellow here. That means that the most current data that I've archived for this machine actually violated uh, some warning levels that I've set up. Uh, these two machines over here are in the red, which means that their data is in alarm condition. Uh, it's violated. Uh, again, these are levels that we put on a trend plot. 
let me just open one here. Let's just go with this. Uh, this is a, a Caterpillar gen, gen set. Uh, you can see that Emiscope project is closed. If I click on the open button, the console is going to send a signal through the database to Emiscope and have it open the project file for this particular machine. So each of these machines has its own project file, which has been set up uh, and stored uh, on the computer so that uh, I can post-process data. Okay, so here it is. It opened up Emiscope, and you can see there's quite a few windows in here. And there is an Emiscope script. Now, this is a relatively new thing that we've added to Emiscope. Uh, scripting is, is just a spreadsheet with a number of Emiscope uh, commands in it. It's got a target window for executing the command and uh, the command to be executed in that window. So it's quite, it's pretty simple. Uh, and the other thing is that I've got some hotkeys up here and these hotkeys have def been defined in Emiscope. Let me just click up here and you can see uh, one of them is called start over and the other one is called acquire data. So I've created just two in this project and uh, those are defined over here in the script menu. Uh, so here, here's where I define them and I, I give them a name and I say when this hotkey is pressed execute this script and, uh, and then here's a button here that says uh, show that hotkey in console. So again, we pass the hotkeys through the database from Emiscope to the console. So the operator of the console can actually control Emiscope, tell it what to do in terms of post-processing. Now, here we got a, a simulated case. Here, here we have some pre-recorded time histories, and there's a number of them in here that have been taken off of this machine. You can see there's 14 channels here. Uh, we actually have simulated a couple of channels of temperature. You can see them down here, degrees uh, centigrade. These last two uh, are thermocouples or some sensor like that. So we're just simulating a kind of a mix of vibration. The other channels are all NGs. You can see they're triaxial, uh, 1x. YZ, 2XYZ, 3X, and so forth. So this is just some pre-recorded data. Then over here to the right is a, one of our acquisition windows that's been attached to this data block. And it's going to process data out of the time records and compute what we call an ODSFRF down here. And this is all going to happen automatically when I press a hotkey from the console because that's what these scripts that I have in here are going to do. Uh, after it's computed in ODSFRF, again, an ODSFRF is just the auto spectrum of the response together with a cross spectrum between the response and a reference response. So that's what that's all about. When the ODSFRF is calculated, we store it up here in its own data block. And you can see in here, here's a data block with 12 uh, vibration. These are simply vibration uh, ODSFRFs. And we're going to save the, we got a peak cursor here. We're going to save the peak value of, of the running speed. And that is the first order ODS, or the running speed ODS that gets stored over here in a shape table. And then all this information, both the spectra and the shape table, are archived into the database. And, and then console on the other side will display this information. So let me bring console back up here. And um, let's go back. OK, it says that uh, the Cat5 generator gen set is, is open in Emiscope. So let's go in here and and look at, OK, I'm going to make this large. And you can see uh, here's the model of the gen set. And it's animating. And the, uh, the little cubes are, uh, you can see they're just kind of floating in space. 
but they're an indication of where the data was actually taken with an accelerometer. And when I put the cursor on the on the little cube, it shows me the X, Y, and Z data there, or the vertical, horizontal, and axial uh, data that was acquired from that one. And here's the other one. And then you can see down here on the motor, this this cube is yellow, and in fact the uh, the axial vibration uh, on the generator is exceeding a warning level, which has been preset. Uh, here's one of the thermocouples, one of the temperatures that uh, is there is indicating a temperature, and here's another one down here on the coupler. So those are, um, you can see this little thing got in the way here. We've got a kind of a, a shroud uh, around the genset, and it's it's actually rotating as part of the animation. And then the rest of the, you know, you can see we, we've got really 12 degrees of freedom here and or 14 with the temperatures included, but the animation is being interpolated. The base has been fixed and this is all part of the MEScope animation capability that uh, I, can, I can use to get a realistic animation. Now let's look at some other things here uh, on this machine. I'm going to go back here and, and uh, go to the home and, and this is a, a different display. It's called a tab display and now I've got a trend plot, my model, and some gauges. So we saw some of that before. Here's the gauges. So the gauges are showing the current value of, of uh, all of the data, the 14 degrees of freedom there, here's the temperatures, and then vibration uh, X, Y, Z. Uh, here's the model that we've been looking at. Uh, let's go to the trend plot. Now I'm just trending one of the values. You can see this is a vibration level in inches per second. So MESCOPE has actually integrated the data for us, and we're looking at Ips or inches per second, and I've got the hotkeys up here. Well, I've, I've just got a single hotkey for this machine, which says acquire the data. Now, if I was hooked up to uh, a multi-channel acquisition front end, then I could acquire, uh, you know, two channels, four channels, whatever of the data, post-process that. But I could also have MESCOPE program to import a data, uh, some data, and that could be spectrum data. I simply import it from uh, a UFF file, for instance. Uh, universal file format is a format that many of the data collectors and analyzers use to save spectra. So I could, Im I could set MESCOPE up with programming uh, scripting to import that data, uh, integrate it, do whatever else I want to do, set up cursors, uh, pick off the uh, running speed or higher orders, uh, and uh, save it into a shape table, archive all that data into the database, and this is what we're looking at here. So I'm going to push this, this uh, hotkey up here. Uh, let, let's, uh, let me uh, make this smaller so we can kind of see. Uh, we like to say the MESCOPE is running under the hood here. Uh, I'm going to push this hotkey and you'll see that MESCOPE will start executing this script here because it's the same as pressing the hotkey in MESCOPE. So now you can see it running there. It's going through the script. You can see that it moved the cursor here to the beginning and grabbed some data. Now I need to go back here and show all my data. So this is the a bar chart of just one of the vibration signals, uh, two tenths of an inch per second. Which one is that? Well, I can display any of the data in my archive shape. Uh, I'll just show you how I've set this one up. This is just looking at the generator out in the horizontal position. I can select any number of these, but uh, for simplicity, we're just going to look at one here. And so this is how I would import the data from my collector or actually acquire data if I'm connected up 
with a computer and this software to a, uh, a data collector. Uh, see some of the newer ones are wireless. So we got wireless Excels now and so forth. So the yeah, we're hearing an alarm. I think that's a watch alarm maybe going off. There we go. That's your... Sorry, that's my watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, there we go. All right, good. Uh, but you can see as I acquire data, what it's doing down here is, is moving the cursor uh, into these time records and then the acquisition window is post-processing this data and putting it into a data block up here. Let me just do this again so you can see how it works. And uh, you'll see the peak change here a little bit perhaps as, uh, as the data, as different data is, uh, is brought in. So actually it's on auto scale so you didn't quite see that happen but I can just simply keep acquiring data here and you can see as, as it walks through my time records it's grabbing uh, different samples of time data and then uh, the horizontal motion at the end of the generator is being displayed down here in this, uh, in this trend plot. If I go back to my model, now we haven't set up uh, the warning levels. I could go into that, but when I exceed a warning level on any of these channels of data, uh, these uh, these little cubes are going to change color. So it's a red light, green light system. And if I go back here, you can see that my latest set of data here is telling me that that machine is okay. Let's go to a different machine here. Let's go to the hammer mill and I'm going to open its project in ME scope. And here we go. So you can see it's uh, sent the signals to ME scope and it's opening up its project to post process the data for this machine. Now it's open. So I can go in here and click on this and now I've got some, uh, you can see here now it's saying hammer mill. I've still got my cat gen tabs back here, but I can go over here now to the hammer mill. Uh, so as I click on these machines in the, in the gallery, it will open a tab that allows me to look at the data for each of the machines in more detail. So let me press this again. So now you can see it's uh, it's doing a very similar thing, but this is a different set of data for the hammer mill. Um, and I'm going to do this a couple of times. You can see it acquiring data. So again, this is kind of a simulation of actually getting live data or simply importing data that I may have saved with a data collector. Um, portable data collector in the field and I'm simply going to process all that data. So let's go to the model here and here's the model of the, let me get this up here, you can see again exaggerated motion but uh, the data is all within our, our warning levels. Um, now I can create a baseline anytime I like uh, when this model was first set up in the database. Uh, if I go back here and here's a command up here called uh, update the baseline. So that's going to update my uh, my uh, monitor data that's uh, basically an ODS and if I go into uh, you can see we're in animation here if I go to my model I can actually, I'm displaying the current shape. If I put the baseline up here, now I've got um, the current and the baseline. And you can see they're, they're very similar. Uh, maybe we can get them to change here a little bit. These bars over here are giving me, a, this is what we call MAC or Model Assurance Criterion and SDI or Shape Difference Indicator. Let me just turn those off because it's uh, it's a little more confusing to have have that stuff on. So we'll turn those off and make this a little bit smaller. 
and let's just go collect some more data and see if we can get a difference here between the two. And, uh, and then I want to go ahead and show you how we would document document all this with a movie. Okay, let's see. I want to go back to my model and I've got baseline versus current. Okay, you can see that now my current over here, uh, some of these are turning different colors because my current data uh, is violating some of the warning levels that I've set up. So let's go ahead and document this data if we want to send this to uh, let's say over to the operations people. Uh, let's go back to the animation and right here I can create a video. So this is going to start making a video of this and uh, just selling some futures here. We're going to record uh, voice along with the video so that when you're documenting this for operations you can explain to them uh, which machine you just took the data on and uh, what the problem was. Maybe, maybe you can explain the condition and so they can see that, gee, this machine is not running as, as uh, well as it should. Maybe we should take it offline. Uh, but rather than a report with Spectra in it and things like that that they don't understand, uh, you can simply uh, create a video like this and tell them exactly what what you found uh, with this new set of data. So I'll, I'll complete the video and here it's saying where do you want to save it? I'll just put it on my desktop uh, and uh, we just call it, uh, I don't know, we'll call it Mark's video and we'll save that and now if I go down to my desktop and, and take a look uh, let me go to Mark's desktop down here at the bottom and here's the video that you can send to uh, operations and show them exactly what's occurring with that machine. So this is the way that we think your job will become easier in the future where you're monitoring lots of machines in the field and uh, using an animated ODS uh, with some audio uh, included in the in the video uh, explain to the operations people exactly what the problem is. What else? There's some more examples here. I can go back and uh, here I am back in the console and I can go back to my machine gallery and uh, let's go back here and uh, here is another machine that uh, vertical pump. So let's let's open that and take a look at it. Now what we've done here is we've used uh, some other capabilities in MEScope that uh, you may not be aware of. Uh, okay, so it's opening up this machine. It says it's now open. So I want to double click on that. And here is uh, a trend plot and here's a vertical pump. Now the thing to notice here is that this pump uh, you can see where the data was taken on the pump and uh, those little cubes are, well they're animating but I'm not seeing the, not seeing the, uh, the gauges right now. But what we've done with this animation is a little more than, than straight interpolation or a geometric interpolation from each of the sensors. Again we have uh, four accelerometers, uh, triax 
and then a couple of temperatures on this that we collected data with uh, with thermocouples. So this was all again simulated data. Here you can see the project. Let me put it up here. This is the project um, in Emiscope running behind the scenes. I have hotkey here. It says acquire data. This hotkey is, is actually a, a flaming hotkey. I can change the look for that. But you can see Emiscope is collecting some data here and going to push it up to um, into the database. And each time I push this hotkey, it's going to grab some more data out of these time records. So that would be, again, a, either simulated live acquisition or simply importing some spectrum data uh, from a UFF file that's stored on the same computer. But what we're doing here is something called shape expansion. And so uh, here are the monitor, same 14, we got a couple temperatures in here and, and four points with the triaxial data. But there's another shape table. What we're doing is, is actually uh, expanding the vibration data with some mode shapes of this vertical pump. And so what you're seeing here is, is something that you couldn't get from a geometric now let me just push this over to the side here, and we'll push this one over to the side. And so now we've got uh, Emiscope here on one side of my screen, and let's see if I can drag this down, and the vertical pump. But we're animating this model, all the points in the model, using an expanded ODS that we obtained in Emiscope by uh, using a modal model. So the whole idea here is that the uh, there's a resonance here and you can see this is kind of a torsional mode if you look at it from the top that is dominating the ODS where we took the data uh, and uh, actually it's a combination of the modes and this is another form of curve fitting. So we're curve fitting mode shapes analytical mode shapes for a, a cantilever uh, motor pump like this to the experimental data and that's how we're able to get this type of an animation a little more realistic and in the sense that uh, this data is actually showing that a, a, a torsional uh, resonance is involved uh, and this is how the, the pump is vibrating at, the, at this with this particular set of data. I can go back here and ask Emiscope to give me some more data and it will go back over here and run its script. You can see it racing through the script there and it's actually logged some newer data into my uh, into the database for this machine. Mark, that's about all I had to show today. Uh, again, we can make a video here comparison, uh, same thing, we've already made one. Uh, the whole idea is that we can document uh, this ODS uh, animation with a video and uh, as I said we don't have it available yet but we're going to add the audio to the video so that you can document your, uh, your data as you collect it in the field for the operations people. Do we have any questions? Uh, we did have one question from uh, Dan Perry. Dan asked if uh, the machines could be labeled in the video to ID the baseline versus the current. Um, yes. And <clears throat> well, first of all, the machines are labeled here, but I can label all of my shape data. Uh, let's go back in. Uh, gee, which one haven't we looked at? Let's just go into this. Uh, this aerial compressor here and because it's got a couple of it's got first order and second order shapes that are being stored now you can see emiscope is opening up over here and now it says it's open so let's go into that machine and um, 
Go ahead. Oh, I didn't have any questions. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we do have another question, but we'll, we'll go ahead and finish your answer here. All right. Uh, let me just show here. I'm going to go to the tab display. Let's go to the model. So here's a here's a compressor. Uh, is it animating? I'm not sure. Let's go to animation. Yes, there's deformation here. Uh, the deformation's uh, on, is it? There you go. Form. There we go. So there, there it is. Now this is again. This is this is a geometric interpolation from the the four excels, and then we got some thermocouples here in the middle. Um, each of the excels is labeled. So in the movie, one way would be to simply make a movie uh, with the accelerometer data shown as it is. Now. That if the question is, can I leave that up there in the movie? Uh, I don't think so. As soon as I move the mouse away from it, it's going to go away. But that would certainly be a, a good way to uh, to document it right there. If this guy happened to be, or, or, let's just go see if we can turn him into uh, yellow or red. I'm going to take some more data here. And, oh, I know how we can do it. We can actually... Uh, Let's go to a comparison display, and I'm going to, oh, over here in the model, you can see I'm just animating the current first order. Let's change that to the current second order, because we got two shapes in here, and then we'll display the current first order there. Uh, let me turn these off, because uh, this was not set up correctly. Uh, so these bars are always going to show one because of the temperature in there. But anyway, here we go. Um, I think I've got a model with second order versus first order. And yeah, you can see there's there's no labels up here telling you that other than up here in the pick list. We certainly would want to document all that in the video, that you're looking at the first order here, the second order here, and uh, and so now you can see the second order has violated uh, one of its warning levels. Let me go crank the amplitude here a little bit so we can Are we animating with a little more animation? Speed. Okay, well, there we got probably more than we want in terms of, <laughs> of animation. But you can see that the, the second order, um, now I think it's on a relative scale. Let's see, scaling. Oh, it's on auto scale. Let's go to this one. Okay, so now we got them both moving around, first and second order. Uh, but the question is a good one. Uh, you know, we should have more documentation right here in the movie. Uh, certainly with audio, we'll be able to explain what's going on, but that would be more useful to explain the the problem as opposed to uh, having some you know some good labels up here to show show yeah. what's going on in the movie. We do have another question here from Joel. How long did it take to collect the data for the models? Um, how long does it take to collect them? How long did it take? To, I assume that Joel's asking if these are if this is real data coming in. No, this is simulated that we took off of a, uh, some rotating uh, simulators that we have here at Vibrant. Uh, again, Vibrant is a software company. We don't do consulting. We don't do route-based data collection. Uh, many of you who perhaps are attending do those kind of things. Uh, Emmyscope MSS is a tool that you can use to document your data with animation. So that's the point of all of this. Um, we are not in the business of acquiring people's data for them and producing reports. 
Uh, there are other companies that do that, and like I say, some of you may be in the business of doing that. Uh, Route-based data collection is the most common way to take data in a plant uh, in America, and I think worldwide. Uh, it's the least expensive, and uh, there are many, many machines in a, in a refinery, a petrochemical plant, power plant, that are called rest of plant where we use uh, accelerometers and magnets to collect data on a weekly or uh, monthly basis. As I mentioned, the other thing is the main equipment, uh, power turbine and so forth in a plant, will have uh, proximity probes in the bearings. And I don't have a good example here, but we can actually set up an animated ODS using the prox probe data vertical and horizontal and show uh, the shaft of a, a rotor uh, machine, uh, you know, a, a turbine or a pump or a generator uh, actually moving within the, in the space of the, the fluid bearings. So there's more things we can do with this. This is a kind of a contrived example. Uh, don't don't trust our data. This data came off of a, a simple rotor kit where we simply uh, attached some accelerometers at, at four locations, uh, used one as a reference, and, uh, and that's the way this data was created. Got another, another question from Joel. How, uh, about how long did it take to write the script to process the information for the models? Uh, that's a good question. That's that's similar to answering the question, how long did it take to build a model like the one you're looking at? Uh, it's, we have a model store on our website. Uh, actually, it's not working right now. We're improving it. Uh, Maybe so you can go you take, have, a, take a, show them the script actually that's running. Yeah, here's the this, script yeah. that's running over here. Uh, these are just Emmyscope commands. Now, I have written all these. This is part of my project. Uh, when I push the hotkey over here, it's going to be the same as pushing the hotkey in ME scope that says acquire data. So let me let me just push it. You can see it. It'll it'll push the hotkey in ME scope and go rattling through. Uh, there it is. It did all the all the post processing. So this is quite a bit of post processing because we're taking time records, computing ODS FRS saving them into a data block. And then down here at the bottom, you can see some archive commands. Uh, let's make this a little larger so you can see some of this. Um, here, let me, let me make this large and this large. And I'll zoom it in here a little bit. So now you can see uh, these are, uh, here's the acquisition window. Here's the shape window. Uh, these are some script commands that are part of a standard MEScope uh, package. Here's a tools command that's saving shapes. And uh, so it, it's a little bit of programming, but the nice part about the script is it, it saves with the project so that when I open a project that has hotkeys and a script in it, uh, once I've written this, it will run forever. So. If I have a route-based, uh, and these four machines are all doing very similar things with the data. So, and that's, I think, typical of a route-based data collection program where you want to post-process your data in a very similar way. Um, and again, if we're just importing uh, spectrum data that's been acquired with a, a data collector, then we a lot of these commands wouldn't be necessary. We just have an import command uh, that would point at a UFF file somewhere on, a, on the disk, open the data, uh, open that UFF file, bring it in, uh, maybe integrated to from acceleration to velocity. This is an example that's also changing the temperatures from centigrade to Fahrenheit. Uh, some of those features are all built into MEScope. So Emmyscope's doing all the post-processing, and then console is the graphics package for making movies and uh, documenting with trend plots the results and setting warning levels and so forth. 
I think it's important to note too that that you know we're not going to expect you to know how to do all the scripting. Um, so you know if if you move down this process, we can certainly provide scripts that would replicate what you're seeing here, um, and then perhaps work with you on something else that you know might be something you know a little bit more uh, more involved if necessary. Yeah, that that's a good a good comment. Just like the models where we provide models for our uh, our customers, we're going to provide example scripts where, yeah. uh, you know, it'll be a little bit machine dependent, so you'll have to take a model of your machine and, and set it up uh, with the right animation so that you're animating the correct points and so forth. But, uh, yeah, you can certainly take a script and say, well, this is pretty close to what I want and go in and edit it. There's, we have all the editing commands uh, in Emmyscope for doing that. Uh, we got a question from uh, Nabil asking which Emmyscope version can be used with the machine condition videos? Uh, any of them. Uh, let's go back and, and look at we'll go back and look at the price list for the MSS uh, series. So this is where we started today with this diagram, but down here are the packages. So this is a basic package. Uh, this is Visual ODS, which is our basic Emmyscope VES package. Now it's got an HKO license. That's hotkey only. So you cannot save the project. You'd have to uh, have the scripting and the project set up for the machine and then the rest of the parts are the MEC 1000 which is the console and the database. So this is a fairly low price to get started and uh, and then as you add uh, this has got acquisition so if you're actually doing live acquisition then uh, it's got a VES 700 which is the acquisition window which would uh, this could be in one of our uh, portable carrying cases uh, and it all would work inside there. Down here we've got signal processing so depending on whether you're going to do some integration differentiation, FFT, uh, more post-processing, you know the price starts to go up. But just for acquiring, let's say taking data that's already computed in a spectrum analyzer, importing it, uh, running a script that's been set up with a with a fully working version, uh, then uh, this is a fairly uh, inexpensive way to get started with uh, you know an MSS package, and that can handle as many machines, as many test points as you want to include. And again, as Mark mentioned, uh, this is a HKO version. Uh, that's fifty percent of the cost of a visual ODS. So that's how this price got down here so low. Uh, a visual ODS I think is $4,700 by itself, but the HKO is half of that and then plus the database and the console software. Um, so uh, if you had a fully working copy then you can make your own scripts uh, with the hotkeys and it would all work as we've demonstrated here today. We had, uh, one more question from Joel. He was asking about the animation. Uh, is the current animation being displayed with uh, only using the four triax excels? Uh, and that is correct, uh, in addition right. to interpolation. Yeah, this is a standard feature in Emmyscope where we use geometric interpolation. So what all these, I mean, these, these models have thousands of points in them, obviously, to, to look like this. They're, they're, they're more than a stick model. They're a surface model with, and we have lights shining on them and so forth. Uh, but we're animating the complete model and, and, you know, it'll get unrealistic in the sense that we've only got data at four points in X, Y, and Z, which is typical of what you would take in a route-based data collection program and uh, the rest of the points on these models are being animated using the nearest uh, point 
what we call a measured point. So the measured points, there's only four of them uh, for the vibration, and all the other points are, are simply uh, coming along for the ride, so to speak. Now, if we go back to the, let's say, the, the gen set, here it is. Now, what we did there is we fixed the base. So the, the base is not going to move. And so this animates a little more realistically uh, using, again, just the data from four points. And you're going to get pretty much rigid body motion here, although you know you get some deformation because of the data that we actually took. And then this shrouding here around, this has all been fixed too, so it won't move. But the fan and the, the radiator and, uh, well, the, the shroud around the fan, this is all uh, being interpolated from the nearest. Uh, and this is a standard feature in Emiscope. So this model was set up in Emiscope, stored into the database, and then the console simply displays it. So you get a realistic uh, animation there uh, from only four data points. Uh, but you can certainly argue, well, is it really moving? You know, is the, is the data blur, is the machine, uh, is the motor moving around like that? Uh, without taking more data points, you, you can't really say. But uh, it's certainly a more realistic picture, given that I only have uh, that much data to work with. That was all we had for the questions. Uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, submitting your questions. Um, we will be doing another webinar next month, uh, looking at probably April 20th, which again is on a Thursday. Uh, incidentally, we also are going to be exhibiting at the Reliability Conference in Las Vegas uh, from April 24th through the 27th. So if you're going to be attending that, please stop by our booth. We'll be demonstrating the uh, Emiscope MSS. We're also doing some presentations during that week. Uh, so we'll get a little more in-depth into the product itself, and uh, hopefully uh, we get a chance to meet you in person. Um, we also are recording this webinar, so I'll be sending out a recording here. Uh, it usually takes uh, an hour or two to process, uh, and then I'll go ahead and email out that link. And if you missed anything uh, during this uh, presentation, you can go back and catch that. Um, actually, you know, we, we got one more question that just popped in from Anthony here. Let's go ahead and get this answered. Is it any easier to import models from other CAD models or using models in Emiscope Store? That's a good question, Anthony. We got, there's lots of different ways. Uh, one of the things that we do have is a SketchUp importer. So you can um, get models from SketchUp and import those into Emiscope. You can build models within enemy scope, um, but a lot of people will simply import them from CAD programs. Uh, Dad, I'm, I'm not familiar. What are the different formats? Um, maybe you can pull that. Oh, here we go. We're going to take a look at it right now. I know we got a, a few different formats that we can import. Just a few. There they are in that list. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> so so uh, that, much. Well, that's data box. Let, let's. Uh, Let's go. That that that's data blocks. So that would be the time or frequency data. But for structure models, there you go. Here we go. So you see AutoCAD, Autodesk, and SketchUp. If you go out to yeah. the Google SketchUp uh, website, there are literally thousands. I mean, Google is this is almost like YouTube. People are constantly putting models out there. So some of these models actually were, I think, imported from SketchUp. And then we we tuned them up a little bit in Emiscope and, you know, attached the what we call it, data assignment. We assign the data to different points on the model. And the easiest way to do this is to simply add some more points. You can see these points that are animating uh, with the cubes are points that we added to uh, just in space. They're just floating in space. Uh, they're not really part of the model itself, but the interpolation then, the geometric interpolation, will take the motion of uh, these points in space and uh, 
make the the nearest points on the model. Uh, and this this model here has got literally thousands of points in it, and so that all happens. Uh, the software does all that in the blink of an eye. Um, but yeah, there, we have a lot of ways to get models and data into Emmyscope. And incidentally, there is a uh, we have a YouTube video on creating models. So if you go out to our YouTube site. There is a whole tutorial on creating models. Uh, so if you're so inclined and you want to, you know, uh, spend a little time building a model, if you got some extra time on your hands, uh, we certainly uh, there's there's a YouTube you, tutorial on creating models in Emmyscope. So you can find that out on our YouTube site. Um, we'll also be posting all of we we'll post this pre presentation plus we have all of our past webinars. Uh, out there on the Vibrant Technology YouTube site. So uh, take a look at that if you get a chance. And uh, there's a lot of good information out there, tutorials, webinars, uh, documentation, etc. Yeah, I might mention the, the Wavefront, the alias, uh, or Elias, I guess, Wavefront, it's uh, OBJ files. Those have photographs in them also. And we resell we don't do it ourselves. We resell a package called Photo Modeler. So if you want a really realistic model and want to see it animate, uh, you can take digital photographs with your iPhone. Uh, you take about eight pictures around the machine, and uh, that software will create a, a 3D model from the photographs. And uh, Microsoft and other people are developing this technology also. So again, uh, you can get very realistic models, uh, and if they're in that OBJ format, uh, import them into Emmyscope, and now you're animating a model with photographs on the surfaces, uh, very realistic uh, to do that. I could show some examples, but we'll just uh, leave it at that. And uh, again, you don't want to make a career out of building 3D models or building scripts, you want to beg, borrow, and steal as much as you can to get, uh, you know, get a realistic picture so you can make some videos and uh, show off your data to people in operations who need to see that, hey, this machine has got a real problem here. Uh, it's time to, uh, to do something about it. Okay. Are we wrapping it up, Mark? Let's go ahead and wrap it up, yep. Okay. Thanks for attending, and we'll see you next month. Have another topic available uh, with the use of Emmyscope um, for this machine monitoring. We also have an application. Uh, we're getting into environmental monitoring. This is our ESS. Again, very similar to what you saw today, except for instead of monitoring the vibration of a machine, you're, you're uh, measuring acoustic and vibration levels uh, out in a construction site uh, by some train tracks, uh, uh, wherever environmental monitoring is needed. So we're using Emmyscope in that application also. Um, Mark, we might mention that we've got some other very simple videos or, uh, you know, if I click under signal analysis, you want to know what Emmyscope, this is a, a, a new set of uh, PDFs that we have available that uh, explain a lot of the features in Emmyscope. Uh, we have brochures, but these PDFs are kind of nice. Uh, they're PDFs of, of uh, slide presentations. So you can very quickly scroll through these and, and uh, have a a quick look at some of the features in in Emmyscope uh, that are available with our different packages. So this is our signal processing, and uh, if I just go back here, so we can send this out too if any of you are interested. Or a brochure. If I click on features, this is this is a, a video uh, or a, a PDF. Now here's a photo model of a of a uh, model car that we you can see all the points and so forth. Uh, but 
there are, and here's a photo model of the Vibram beam animating. Here's a model airplane that we tested here. Uh, we haven't tested the 747, but this is a model I think that was gotten from SketchUp. Here's some photo models that we built. Um, so a lot of the different features, very easy to scan through here and and uh, and see these various things. And now here we get into modal analysis with curve fitting and so forth. Anyway, let's wrap it up. Okay, doke. Okay. All right. Nabil, I got your question about updating from version 5.0 to 6.2. I will um, email you some information about that. I'll put you in contact um, with uh, Brian Richardson. He can get, get a hold of you and uh, walk you through the steps to get you upgraded. Uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, All everybody, right. and we will see you next month for another uh, webinar. Very good. Have a good one. Bye. All right. Bye.